Ken Steele, 14 years old, hears voices coming from his radio for the first time in his life. No one else can hear these voices but Ken and they are telling him to kill himself. Terrified, Ken turns off the radio, but the voices do not stop. The voices say, you should die. You should have never been born. Frightened, Ken runs to his parents' room. Their door is closed. Then Ken runs down the stairs and is by his grandmother's door. The voices are saying, die, die, die. You're worthless, no good. Do it now, not later. Ken staggers into the living room and collapses on the floor. Ken's mom asks him what he's doing up so early. Ken stares at his mom. Then in the sing-song cadence children use, the voices chant, na 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 na, we're still here. You thought you got rid of us, no such luck. The voices tell Ken how ugly he is. How can you bear to look at yourself, they say. Ken goes downstairs to eat breakfast. His father and mother leave for work. His grandma let him watch TV before school. The Today Show is on with Barbara Walters and Hugh Downs. There are a number of people on screen. And their voices seem to be talking to Ken. They say, Today, Kenny Steele will kill himself. Ken is shocked. Had he heard right? Hugh Downs, co-anchor of the Today Show, tells Ken, Don't kill yourself, Kenny. Don't give up. Try not to do it. Other voices are telling Ken to leave home and that his family is no good for him. The voices tell Ken, you're worthless. Your parents don't want you anymore. You could leave home. Better yet, you could kill yourself. Yes, that's it. That's the answer. Die. Ken's grandma tells him that he's running a temperature. Ken's dad says that the president will be speaking about the Cuban Missile Crisis tonight. He says to Ken that he wants him to hear what John F. Kennedy has to say about the communist. As Ken's father continues to ask him questions, Ken does as the voices instruct him. He covers his ears with his hands and turns his back on him. Ken's father becomes enraged. Go to your room without dinner, he says. Time passes. Ken continues to struggle with his voices. And one day, his parents announce that his mother is pregnant. Ken hears a voice representing his mother's unborn child whom the voice has decided is to be a boy. When he is near his mother and her swollen belly, the voice says, I am coming, I'm going to be born. Other voices tell Kenny to jump in front of a car on Route 69 or pour lighter fluid over his body and light himself on fire or hang himself in the forest. Time passes and Ken's brother Joseph is born. The voices tell Ken, he's here now, Joey's the good son. Your dad will love him more, and he will deserve it. It's time for you to go. Stop hanging around. One day, Ken, his parents, his grandma, and his baby brother, Joey, are in the living room while his family is fussing over the baby. Ken responds loudly to the demands of his voices. Ken says out loud, Okay, I will kill myself. I'll set myself on fire, or I will hang myself. Ken's mother screams, and Ken's father tries shaking Ken back into reality. Realizing what he's done, Ken runs from the house back into the forest. That night, Ken makes three different attempts on his life. By hanging, by pouring lighter fluid on his head, and an attempt at getting run over by a car on the highway. Exhausted, Ken falls asleep in the forest. When morning comes, he goes back home to find two police cars in the driveway. Ken's father is having an animated conversation with two state troopers. The voices tell Ken, they're going to shoot you. See the guns in their holsters. Your dad is arranging to have you killed. The next day, Ken's parents take him to see the family physician, Dr. Sullivan. In Sullivan's office, the doctor asks Ken's parents if he can speak to Ken alone. They talk for a bit, and eventually Ken's parents take him back home. At home, Ken's dad is talking to Dr. Sullivan on the phone. He hangs up the phone. Ken approaches his father and asks, Dad, what does Dr. Sullivan think I have? Can you spell it out for me? Ken's father writes down one word and shows it to Ken. Schizophrenia.
The day the voices stopped. Chapter 2. Further into the abyss. Summer 1963 through December 1965. Pages 13 through 32. Ken finds out at the library that schizophrenia is an incurable and hopeless condition. He seeks solace at church and after confessing that his voices wanted him to kill himself. The priest who is concerned about his safety calls the police. Ken is taken to a hospital where because his father is in denial about his illness, his dad refuses treatment for him and takes Ken home. As his condition deteriorates, Ken changes from being a top student to a failure and drops out of school at age 16. He spends the next two years as a recluse, only gaining comfort from his grandmother, who ultimately believes he is possessed by the devil. When Ken's parents refuse to support him past his 18th birthday, Ken moves to New York City to enroll in a writing program, since reading and writing are the only thing he likes to do. The Day the Voices Stopped Chapter 3 The Big City January 2, December 1966 Pages 33 to 50 Ken arrives in Grand Central Station, where he feels lost but is befriended by Ted. He moves into a YMCA and finds a job first as a copy boy, mail clerk, and then as an assistant copywriter for a publishing company. His voices make it impossible for him to work full days, and after six months of declining productivity, is fired. Desperate, he seeks help from Ted, who turns out to be gay, and makes him a deal, becomes Ted's lover and a prostitute for the pimp, Nick, who owns a number of gay bars where Ken picks up his clients. After six months, he gets fed up and runs away from Ted and Nick. Quickly out of money and at his wit's end, Ken climbs to the roof of an apartment building, ready to jump off. But before he can do so, a resident discovers him and calls the police. Ken is taken to a psych hospital. The Day the Voices Stopped. Chapter 4, Welcome to Bedlam. January to Spring, 1967, pages 51 through 82. For the first couple of months at Manhattan State Hospital, Ken is kept in isolation and heavily sedated. Suffered blindness, a side effect of too much Thorazine. At his first court hearing, he clams up at the urging of the Greek chorus of his voices, now orchestrated by the ruler. A nurse takes a liking to Ken and guides him through a second hearing where the voices relent. Ken gains four hours a day of recreation outside his room, where he pursues his favorite activity of reading while steering clear of the most aggressive patients. Ted visits and Ken decides to escape, believing that staying with Ted would be better than being locked in the hospital. However, once at Ted's place, he has second thoughts and returns to Manhattan State, where a social worker tells him his only alternative is Harlem Valley State Hospital, upstate, in the country, unfortunately, Shortly after arriving there, Ken is brutally raped. The Day the Voices Stopped Chapter 5 Caught in the Revolving Door Fall 1967 to December 1976 Pages 83 through 118 Ken recovers first in a medical hospital, then in Harlem Valley's infirmary. But as soon as he is well enough to walk again, he escapes to Boston where he frequents Skid Row for several months. Eventually, his voices land him in Metropolitan State Hospital in Waltham, Massachusetts for two years. He runs away from there and tries to hang himself, ending up in Westboro State Hospital, also in Massachusetts, where he changes his name to Shannon Steele and is befriended by a nurse who gets him into a halfway house. He becomes a cook at a nursing home for eight months, but after the nurse dies in childbirth, Ken is devastated and leaves everything behind. He hitches to Chicago and meets Carl, a rich businessman they become lovers. Carl abandons him while they're on vacation in Las Vegas and Carl kills himself, having lost his parents in a car accident when he was a kid, a trauma he never recovered from. Ken voluntarily checks into a psych ward in his despair. From there, he is transferred to a halfway house and gets a job, but once again feels compelled to leave by the voices who lead him to Colorado and an involuntary admission to Pueblo State Hospital. The Day the Voices Stopped, Chapter 6, Closing Other Doors, January 1977 through December 1989, pages 119 through 162. Ken learns that his only hope of getting out of this notoriously dead-end hospital is for his family to take him in. So he appeals to his father after 10 years without communication. 
and convinces him he's Ken's only hope. However, Ken cannot readjust to parents who do not understand him and a younger brother who becomes estranged after good faith efforts to get to know Ken. While working at a factory to pay his parents some rent, Ken decides, at the voice's behest, to overdose on psych meds he's been hoarding. He downs his medication with copious amounts of alcohol at a bar, passes out and then is arrested for lewd behavior for which he has no memory. To escape conviction, Ken flees his hometown. Next stop, two years at Norwich State Hospital in Connecticut. After a stay at a halfway house, he decides the best way to kill himself is jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. So he heads for San Francisco, where the assassination of Harvey Milk, a gay city supervisor, sends him into a tailspin. Finding himself in a private hospital for the first time, part of his rehab involves working on the campaign for mayor of Dianne Feinstein. But he is triggered by a proposition from a sleazy gay bar. Heading to the nearest rooftop for relief from his voices gets him sent to Negra State Hospital. After discharge, he gets involved in local mental health politics and attends the Alternatives Conference in July 1984. But success is too much for him once again, and he becomes homeless, leading to another stint in the psych ward of a municipal hospital, another escape, and another catastrophe. This time he is bitten by a rattlesnake while wandering deliriously in the desert. Saved by some hunters, he goes to a hospital where he received ECT for the first time. Ken reunites with an old lover who takes him to Hawaii, where Ken has an asthma attack, and after recovery he volunteers at a mental health center, starting a self-help group that earns him enough of a reputation that he is appointed to a state alcohol assistance board. Not satisfied with his success, his voices urge him to return to New York City and try jumping from a rooftop again. Chapter 7 Second Chances January 1990 to May 3rd, 1995 Pages 163 through 198 Once again he is whisked away by the police before he can do himself in to Manhattan State but as bad as ever. After being on suicide watch for weeks, Ken pulls himself together and becomes an assistant in the hospital's library. Then a social worker helps him get on SSI and Medicaid. First he attends Fountain House while still at the hospital and then moves in with a member in Manhattan who he works with on the clubhouse's farm in New Jersey through Fountain House's temporary employment program. He moves to Park Slope, but once the temp job ends, he goes into a funk and has a meltdown on the subway home. He discovers the Park Slope Mental Health Center, his first experience of a non-institutional outpatient clinic, where he meets Rita Seiden, who becomes his social worker. Still posing as Shannon Steele, he concocts a new history for himself. As things begin to improve, his voices reassert themselves, and Ken flees. Finally, in the summer of 1993, he returns to Fountain House, and Dr. Seiden not only does the clinic psychiatrist put Ken on a new medicine, Risperidol, with fewer side effects, but Ken takes care of his many medical conditions that have been worsening for years. By this time, he has grown so obese, mainly due to the antipsychotics he has taken over the years, that he is barely ambulatory. Then he gets his own apartment in Manhattan and launches the Voter Empowerment Project, at first by himself, and then with 75 volunteer recruits. He registers 35,000 folks living with mental illness throughout the five boroughs, the project eventually expands to 36 states. Then, on May 3rd, 1995, the voices stop. Chapter 8, The Day the Voices Stopped, May 3rd through December 1995, pages 199 through 218. Ken is so overwhelmed that he can finally hear the world around him without the din of voices in his head that he locks himself in the bathroom for three days and nights to feel safe. His national profile grows as he participates in a housing seminar at the American Psychiatric Association's annual convention. And he's featured in a commercial by NAMI about people living successfully with mental illness. He calls home and informs his family that he's better. His parents visit him one Sunday and he tells Rita the truth about his background and wanderings. Ken celebrates Christmas in his home with his new friends, mostly peers, in what becomes a tradition. Chapter 9 Other People's Stories 
November 1995 through June 1st of 2000. Pages 219 through 240. With Rita's blessing, Ken takes over the center's newsletter and turns it into New York City Voices, a consumer journal for mental health advocacy. The mission is to provide different viewpoints about the politics of mental health care and personal stories by consumers themselves, based on his contacts with NAMI, MHA, and the Voter Project. Ken establishes a phone information and referral service in his home, answering questions from peers, their families, and providers. With his person-centered approach that empowers the consumer, he establishes the awakening self-help groups throughout the city with the goal of full recovery. Then he's interviewed on WNBC and receives 1,500 calls from around the country, answering every one of them. Erica Good writes a front page story about Ken in the New York Times. One of the people who learns about Ken is Jacob Frey, who reaches out to him on behalf of his son, Dan, who has just gone through his first mental health crisis. Ken becomes Dan's mentor, and Dan eventually becomes the new editor of the paper after Ken dies of a heart attack on June 1st of 2000. Since Ken's death, New York City Voices was renamed City Voices to reflect its reach beyond New York. A dedicated group of individuals came together to guide the projects, which include website and social media activities. Peer Workforce United, a bi-monthly support group for peer support workers. Cracking Up, an annual mental health comedy show. Peers in person. Monthly social events at New York City parks and museums. Friendship Squad, which establishes peer-to-peer -peer friendships for people with mental health and addiction challenges. And weekly Zoom discussions that examine the spiritual side of extreme states that are often labeled as psychiatric disorders. 